Well, welcome to the Wednesday Wellbeing Show. My name is Amanda Joy. I'm your host this evening. And what an evening I've got lined up. The most amazing and inspiring, interesting guest tonight. Tonight I'm talking with Ian. Um, Ian is a really interesting guy. Um, he actually was a police officer. Um, 26 years as a police officer. Wow, what what a rare, what a career. Um, but he he retired uh, due to um, ill health, and um, he had um, some other health conditions. I'm going to get him to tell me all about that and his journey as we go through the interview. He was really unaware at that time of that mind body connection and how quite often physical <clears throat> challenges physical issues pain in the body is very much linked with how we feel emotionally and in particular Ian's case it, it was causing him depression so he did a little bit of exploration and came across um, a course. It was a one day, <clears throat> I'm going to say MTech uh, course for horses. And this led him into uh, learning all about the Emmet technique, which I have no idea what that is. So I'm going to find out all about that. And he's also a clinical hypnotherapist, but he works with hypnotherapy in a really, really a fantastic, uh, unique way. Um, and I love it because I'm a big sci-fi geek and I do love uh, anything kind of technical and, and modern. It's fabulous. And Ian uses virtual reality in his therapy room to really empower people and to help them with very rapid transformational processes. Ian, welcome to the Wednesday Wellbeing Show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's lovely to be here. I'm, I, we had a chat on the phone a, a couple of months ago and I was like, got to get you on my show. Virtual reality is so cool. And all of the other skills that you, you bring as well. Fascinating area that you work in. But tell me a little bit about your background um, and your journey to becoming this amazing therapist. Well, like you said, I was a police officer 26 years. So um, from that point of view, I was very much, um, well, let's use the words institutionalized, but we probably are. Everything was black and white. There was no gray areas. Um, and it, even although we attended many um, car crashes, we did first aid and all that sort of thing, we were joined by paramedics, everything can seem very much you've got bones you've got muscles you've got blood pressure you know as long as you've got oxygen and blood you can survive and in mm. fairness i think we've got probably one of the best nhs services in the world as long as you are in serious trouble and what i found was that once you'd been diagnosed or you've got a label of something wrong with you there was probably very little for the ongoing person who just suffers and i'm hoping today some of your listeners might sort of um, resonate with, with things that happened to me. Um, first of all, um, I mean, as being a police officer, you end up getting bumps and bruises every weekend. Um, I was on traffic, so we had numerous car crashes. But I was about 35, 37, and I started getting headaches at night. And uh, I would wake up in the middle of the night, I'd split in headaches, sometimes it was so painful it would make me vomit. So I went to my GP and um, his clinical diagnosis was wait till you hit 40 and I thought oh that's brilliant thanks that's really cheered me up but I suppose to a certain extent <laughs> what I know now we are sort of programmed to believe when you get to 40 and when you get to 50 and when ladies hit their menopause it's all downhill and um, so, so I look back and laugh at that sort of thing <laughs> but, but I had a couple of x-rays and the first one showed that I've got spondylitis and um, so my C4 in the neck was, was narrowed and that was what we thought was causing the problem and then about a year or so later, I had another X-ray uh, and that had gone. So then they said, well, probably you were standing in the wrong position or something was wrong, but we can't, we can't explain that. So I then had an, M I mean, in fairness, the police force were good, they sent them to have an MRI scan, but that came back saying there was nothing wrong with it. And uh, it was only um, oh, it'll be about four years later, I was working on the motorway. We came off at a junction and we were in stationary traffic and somebody ran into the back of us. And I'm not quite sure how you run into the back of a big Volvo. 
Um, <laughs> what happened then was I had, uh, I lost the feeling in my arm. Um, wow. Went straight to, yeah, that's a little bit worrying. So it, it was really good. So I rang my doctor at nine o'clock in the morning when they opened and then told them the story. And they said, can you get here for five past? I said, you bet your bottom dollar I can. But they said it was just whiplash and it would go off within 24, 48 hours, which it did. Um, but I realized then there was something wrong. And I went to see a chiropractor um, and they had like a, a sort of machine where they put little stickers on your back and they sent a signal through your body that would tell you how dense you, your muscles were. Um, and he went, blimey, your neck's a right old mess, blah, blah, blah. But he was the first person to examine me. And what he realized is when he uh, manipulated my neck, I went dizzy and I blurred vision and things were going wrong. So he asked for a copy of the MRI scan and going back to 2003, it was like a Kodak Instamatic sort of negative type thing. And he sent it to Glamorgan University, to their chiropractic radiologist. And he came back saying, you've got a type one Arnold Chiari malformation. And I thought, well, I've never heard of that. Didn't even know what it was. Sounds um, very exciting and complicated. Tell us what it is. <laughs> well, fortunately for me, um, it's very mild. But what it means is, it, it, um, now there's, there's, there's some th various thoughts on here. You can be born with it. Years ago, they thought it was caused by a, a distressful birth where they used forceps and pulled the head. Or there's thought in America that's caused by a car crash and whiplashes or um, repeated trauma to the spinal column. Because our necks and um, head can only move a certain amount of distance before there's serious damage there. And, and I suppose one of the um, specialist, he said, if you imagine your neck as a bit of nicker elastic, when that's overstretched time after time, then it will become weak. But what happened is um, the back of my brain or my brains dropped down a little bit by eight millimeters. It doesn't sound a great deal, but what it means then is your cerebral fluid is sort of um, restricted within your spinal column. So depending on how you lie at night, if your head falls off the pillow, then suddenly the body starts going wrong. You start getting your headaches because your cerebral flu has been affected. So I now had a label for it, but they didn't know what to do. So one option was to have an operation where they put a shunt in. I wasn't really all that keen on that because once you start interfering with the body, the basically what I was told was wait till it gets really bad. And then if we have the operation, the best it will do is hold you where you're at. So everything was really negative and I was thinking, oh, great. Uh, I was a workaholic at the time. Um, I've got a little bit of land that I bought. My children were riding horses. I was building a big horse box. I was building my own house. I was happily married. Life couldn't have been better. So I wasn't negative minded. I was really busy. And I suppose people could say, oh, well, you'd burnt yourself out. You know, but I hadn't. I knew that I was really enjoying life, if you like. And of course, suddenly I'm told by doctors, put your feet up, don't even cut firewood, you know you're finished and, and I'll never forget that when they said you know that's it you're finished put your feet up you can't do everything you wanted to do and I think that's when depression started sitting in mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have it so I would still look for the stables I would still put fence posts in but I noticed what you know from working eight or ten hours a day I was now going down to eight to seven to six to five I remember getting up there one day uh, and I've been there a couple of hours and I thought I've got to go home and I just can't do this so that was it. I sort of hovered for a few years. I mean, obviously I've been retired from the police force, so I was okay, but th this wasn't life. And I was only in my early forties at this time. Now both my children ride and um, horses are always going lame. I, I do equine thermal imaging. So I use a thermal camera on horses. So what I can physically see is how that horse is compensating for um, injury. But I'll, I think this is probably where your, your listeners will resonate here. I didn't look at myself from that point of view. And I think we keep going. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll program on, it was either Prince Harry or William and they went, don't wait till you break. But we do, life's too busy, we keep going. And it's only when you get to that point where you say, I can't go anymore, that we seek help. Well, well that's the, the way I felt. And I think most of the people I treat feel the same. So horses always going lame, you know, when you're competing them, it just seems like it's a bit of a nightmare. And I saw this advert and it was a one day course and a guy called Tony Sherry, who is the um, animal, the animal UK um, director. It was local. Um, 
And I thought, oh, this looks interesting. And it was about how to treat your own horse to keep it generally um, balanced, I suppose, and just keep it in tip top condition. So I said to my daughter, shall we go and have a look at this? And she says, oh, I'm not going on my own. I says, well, I'll come with you. Now, what I hadn't realized, bear in mind I do my thermal imaging, bear in mind I know how the body um, compensates. I was start, I didn't realize at this time that my brain was constantly adjusting how I stood. And when you've got pain in your neck, your body will just adjust your neck. So I was now leaning forward. I've got sore shoulders. I've got sore back, mm. got sore legs. And I've got yeah. fasciitis. And I just couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And for those people that have had it, you know, you put your feet out and you go on your tiptoes and you sort of creep to the bathroom and the pain is immense. At the time I was, I mean, I was putting a big school in for the kids, a big sand school, and it took me three and a half years to do a full week job, really. Um, so anyway, the long and short of it was, I said, so right, we'll go on this course. And during putting the school in, I was taking a photograph of me, and I really looked like an 80-year-old. I was all sort of bent forward. Um, so I went on this course, and Tony's the, the, the instructor. But lo and behold, uh, there's a woman called Claire Stone. She's in Derbyshire. She does the Emmet um, Humans. And she wanted to learn about the horses as well. So she was a little bit apprehensive. So I'm there with my daughter. We've had horses all of her life. And um, she says, can I stick with you guys? So while we're treating this horse, I happened to tell her my life story and how my feet were absolutely killing me. And she went to me, well, we'll sort that at lunchtime. It'll only take 10, 15 minutes. And I just thought, oh, wow. <laughs> I, did, I thought, yeah, what are you having a laugh? And, um, so anyway, at lunchtime, we went in and, and what have you, and she says, take your shoes off. And all she did was just place her fingers on strategic points on the body. And I couldn't believe I suddenly stood almost bolt upright. I felt like I was going back on my heels. I mean, we joked because they put it on Facebook. I thought I was levitating. And you don't realise how twisted your body is mm. because it's just compensating all the time. Suddenly my headache went, um, the pain in my feet, it probably didn't disappear, but it went from sort of eight, nine out of 10, right down to two or three. And, and when you're in pain every day, once that drops, you feel like- oh, you've got Amazing pain. relief. Um, so that was it, I was kind of hooked and I just went, it's weird. And I can't use that word, it's weird, um, but it works. So I says, right, I'm gonna sign up for the horse course. Um, so anyway, I did that, and then I went on the human course, and then I did the dog course. So I'm fully qualified in all three areas. Um, and I suppose your listeners here are very holistic. So whilst Ross Emmett will say they're not meridians, if I say to people, if you imagine where the meridian points are, what we do is a very similar technique. We simply place fingers in certain areas, and what it does is it releases the body. Um, and it really is quite amazing. In fact, the other day I treated a lady, um, she's as fit as anything, she's a boxer, and I just treated her um, to, to a simple Emmett treatment, and she couldn't believe how she could feel what was her tense muscles just releasing. It is absolutely phenomenal. But of course, at this point, I realised um, within sort of two or three days, I didn't feel depressed anymore. I felt my body working better. I still had pains in my neck, don't get me wrong, but we'd sort of gone from eight, nine out of 10, back down to two or three. Yeah. And life was, I could cope with life again. Um, so anyway, but, but the more people are treated, um, I was very lucky, Tony and Claire invited me to do Your Horse Live. With, uh, I don't know if you're, people are here into horses, but there's a big horse show in Warwickshire. So they have a stand, so we went there. So you're treating all these different people and you just find it so fascinating. But what I realised was that actually, although I'm treating the body, it's the mind that's taking control. Mm. Um, so that then encouraged me to do um, clinical hypnotherapy. And uh, I trained with the same company that you trained with. And I just found the link between the mind and the body. Suddenly you get that light bulb moment. You realise yeah. how things are doing what they do and how it works. Um, the Emmett technique works in general, believe it works, um, on the fascia. Um, now, the fascia is the, um, 
I've just had a little upset any vegans here because I went to a vegan show and I mentioned this and I got a bit of a giggle, fortunately. When you cook chicken, there's a little white film on the muscle on, on, the, on the chicken. That is the fascia and that's what's under our skin. And it's only in the last 20 years or so, I think, they've really researched this and realised it's the highway to the brain. So you've got your lymphatics, your nerves, your blood vessels. And when we get stressed, that all tightens up, it tightens the muscles up and so on. So I realised the link then. Um, mm. So, so that's really how I got into all of this. So there's nothing more obscure, you know, take me back five years or six years ago, I would just think to myself, you know, I, I heard your, um, your your podcast about your life and it almost feel, feels like woo-woo because it goes completely against everything that we've been brought up to believe that you go and oh, see yeah. it and, you know, you can actually, some of the um, responses I've had with Emmett has been completely amazing and you just think, wow you know people mm -hmm. who have been ill for 20 or 30 years you do three or four treatments and it just improves the quality of life um mm. but a couple of people at the moment have got parkinson's and i've treated them and their tremors have reduced for about three days Incredible. Now, I know that doesn't mean a great deal um to the average person it does if you've got parkinson's <laughs> well yeah i mean what i would say is go and see an emmet therapist because mm. everything. And, I, and I, I suppose looking back i tried acupuncture i tried physios i tried cut i didn't want to give up and, and it was just spooky that i went to a horse day that i ended up getting treated as a human being but of course <laughs> you know, we're all the same the horses um obviously their legs are slightly different but Functionally, we're very, we're very similar. We've got fascia. And so you can we? see how this, mm. yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. But I think of the fascia as a bit like a, a, a telecommunication system that transmits information around the body, like really rapidly. And if we are stressed, anxious, or if we've got pain, it goes solid and rigid like a, like armour to protect us. Um, <clears throat> but it's quite interesting, isn't it, how how in we, we can understand more about referred pain as well and, and the research on fascia work has really just been in the last i think it's just five years it's really really come out and body it's complete understanding fascia has completely changed the way that i work as a massage therapist um i, I used to go in very you know like deep tissue sports massage and now i have an understanding of fascia i work a lot more um strategically i suppose um and, and and read the body more it's absolutely fascinating so who who came up with the emmet technique i'm guessing it was somebody called mrs emmet or mr emmet but where did it come from where does it originate yeah well it's a guy called ross emmet um and he's from australia so it's quite big in australia and, and this guy's got quite an amazing um life story if you like um I think he's got one of those where he's got a bit of a gift. But what he noticed when he was a child, um, and we've probably all done it, we've probably all tickled, our, tickled the dog and its leg starts going as if it's running. <laughs> well, he did that, but then he put his finger in a different spot and it stopped. So he realised then, even as a child, I think he was, you know, he was under 10, I think, at the time, he realised that by touching certain points, he could control the dog's um, muscle function in effect. Um, he then um, progressed, he became a boxer, um, then he became a, a physiotherapist and he just did this naturally. So it was almost like a natural thing to him. He became a Bowen therapist. Uh, I think he worked with Tom Bowen. So he, he, he worked in the, uh, I think he did horses and he, he did, he was a dog judge, you know, so he did an awful lot where he worked with the animals and the humans. And he's very, very well respected out in Australia. Uh, there's a hospital near where he lives and a lot of the um, doctors there will send the patients across to him. They're a lot more progressive in Australia, aren't they, in terms of how medical, Western medical practitioners and more integrative medical practitioners really communicate with each other. Um, it's, it seems to be there are quite a few years ahead of us there. 
Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting that you talk about Bowen because when you were talking about that using the different pressure points, trigger points, whatever you want to call them, meridian points, acupuncture points, that there's some similarity there. So there's clearly I can see the Bowen influence from Emmett. What's the difference between the Emmett technique and, and say, a Bowen uh, treatment? Do you know? I personally don't because I don't do Bowen. I only do the Emmett. Um, but with what you're saying there about overlap, I work up at the Silver Web Holistic Centre in Clay Cross in Chesterfield. I work with people that do Reiki, kinesiology, um, various other modalities, and we find they all overlap. You know, so no, no matter what technique, technique you've got, we, we all discuss how we can adjust th those particular modalities to suit ourselves. So it's, that there is a big overlap on treating the body, I find. Mm, well, we're all working with energy, energy medicine. We're all working with, you know, human bodies, and uh, there are going to be. A lot, but it is fascinating, isn't it, when you uh, when you talk to somebody who you feel is doing something very different from you, um, and then you chat with them, and you think, oh yeah, it's just a different different way of doing what I'm doing. It's just a slightly different perspective on that. So it came from Australia. Um, with Mr. Emmett, not Mrs. Mr. Emmett, <laughs> and uh, and he he he's got you know a very busy practice out there, and he's he's very well known. But I know that one of the reasons I was very drawn to it was because of the um, the scar tissue work that is done within within uh, within the Emmett, uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Tell me a little bit about the the scar work that that sort of goes with, with Emmett? Well, it's very interesting because um, the scar work isn't part of Emmett. Um, uh, I, I trained in what they call MSTR, which is McLaughlin scar tissue release. But strangely enough, he was a Bowen therapist. And strangely enough, he knew Ross. So although there's no immediate um, overlap with them, they have obviously devised their own um, techniques. Mm. So um, again, you're dealing with the fascia. So... For example, I've treated quite a few people with caesarean scars. Mm. So, so uh, as you were saying there, it's, it, to me, it's a highway to the brain. You're cutting through all of those wires, all of the lymphatics, everything that's telling the body what to do. We're just basically bundling them up and stitching them together. Um, a couple of people I've treated have had chronic fatigue. And one of them said it's really interesting because when we treat the scar, they change mentally as well. You know, they feel mm -hmm. less of a burden. They feel much more um, almost stress relieved, really. Um, some of that may be because, although cosmetically you don't change the scar that much, it's what's going on underneath that really counts. Um, so they feel so much better. They feel more. Um, ladies that have cesarean scars normally feel a bit detached. They don't quite feel right. So they've got the trauma of the scar anyway and the birth. And sometimes that can settle that down. So again, you're working with the fascia. Um, Areas that have perhaps been numb, um, you get the feeling back. Um, sometimes you'll get lumpy areas where the muscle and tissue have pulled together. You can get that down. So, so it makes, again, it's all about quality of life, really. It's improving someone's quality of life. You know. mm, absolutely. I know after you've had surgery or after you've had trauma or, or, um, or, or a cesarean uh, birth, um, it can feel quite traumatic to your body and you can have that emotional disconnection as well as a physical disconnection. How does the, the scar work that you do bring that back together? How is that connection brought back together? Well, what I feel is um, I normally do an emmet treatment with the scar work because by releasing the body, making it more balanced, everything flows so much better. So again, looking at a ho general holistic therapy, um, if your lymphatics are flowing better, your blood flows better, your nerves are working better, you're more balanced, the body itself is working better. So if you then treat the scar and reconnect some of those parts, because um, the body wants to heal itself, and sometimes it just needs a bit of a helping hand. You know, by working on that scar and releasing the tissue, you're reconnecting those nerves that are trying to reconnect themselves. Amazing. 
Amazing. Such, such wonderful work. I'm going to get to the bit that I'm really interested in now. <laughs> I'm a total Star Trek fan. And uh, in Star Trek, I'm going to geek you, geek out a minute for, for, for apologies for those who are not into Star Trek. There's a, there's a hollow suite um, where you can go in and you can have any kind of imaginary world, um, interact with it and feel like you're really there, but it's just inside one room. And I've always fancied having a, a hollow suite in my house. So if they ever invent them, I want one. <laughs> I think it's great. You can be on a starship in the middle of the universe, but uh, you can pop to your local and go down the gym and hang out with your mates in the holodeck. I really enjoy <laughs> I enjoy the idea of that. So the idea of bringing virtual reality um, into, into the therapy room is, is absolutely sci-fi and fabulous. What, are, uh, well, what got you interested in it? I mean, are you a bit of a sci-fi geek like me? Or what was it that really drew you to uh, looking at using this? Well, basically, I, I went on. I went to, uh, uh, as a startup business. I was part of the um, the D two N two Growth Hub, which is a local. Um, it's the East Midlands Chamber of Commerce, so, so they help you out as a startup business. And they had a big demonstra uh, demonstration with a big show in Nottingham. And this guy came on who was using virtual reality, and he was on about um, artificial intelligence and so on. And he that they were using this as a sales gimmick for um, Land Rover, and basically there was a big show. There was a, a proper um, sports car there under a gazebo, and they said to the people, "Put this headset on. Um, we're going to the car's on sort of suspension. We're going to put the guy dressed like the Stig in there just to boost you up, see how it goes." And then what happens is they actually, as soon as the guy puts the headset on, they drop the car off the ramps, and he really does go along and spins around the car park doing handbrake turns. Now they're giggling and laughing because they don't realise this is real. Oh so my goodness! Along. Yeah. So anyway, they then show you at the end and they were saying, what did you think? And it says, oh yeah, but the car couldn't do that. You know, this happened. and then they showed them the real video because they've got videos everywhere. And they went, oh my goodness. And this guy went, I'm buying one. And I thought, yeah. at that point, I thought, wow, that's brilliant because it's how you fooled the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Is so, it real? Um, is it not real? Is it really happening? Is it not happening? <laughs> Just tell him to go on a crazy ride around a car park. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I came back, I was talking to the other half and I was saying to her, wow, this would be fantastic for, you know, using as a therapy. And lo and behold, the next day on Facebook, what pops up? Science. Dun, dun, dun. So <laughs> weird how yeah. Facebook does that. <laughs> and I looked at it, I thought, wow, this is spooky. So I thought there's obviously a reason for it. So I rang up and I spoke to the guy there, a really nice guy, Alex, told him what I did. And um, he said, yeah, not a problem, you know. And, and what I had it on a month for a trial because um, I was a bit dubious. Um, you know, it's one of those things you're taking on a contract for a year, should or shouldn't or what have you. And he said, we'll have it for a month and have it on trial. And the first time I used it on a true um, sort of person with a, um, a fear, if you like, or a phobia, it was amazing. And I just thought, this is just out of this world. Um, I suppose looking at virtual reality to what we do as hypnotherapy, um, there's about 50, I think there's at least 50 different scenarios on there that you can use. Um, you're in complete control, so everything's on the laptop, so I can put new, uh, um, mindfulness through your headset. We'll call it mindfulness on here, but it's all about your breathing. So um, when I use it, I tend to put the uh, problem in the middle, if you like. So I will say to them, let's try some um, virtual reality. So they get used to what's going on. Perhaps do 10 or 15 minutes, then we'll stop and have a cup of tea. Then we'll treat the problem and then I'll do a little bit of mindfulness because they've got various um, relaxation ones on there. But anyway, um, the, the first lady they're treated, she got OCD. And like everything else, with, you do hypnotherapy, they don't always tell you how bad it is. They're just, you know, they're very light about it. So oh, if you can sort this out, it'd be great. And I'm like, okay. So the first thing I did with her was um, there's a, a scenario in there specifically for OCD and fear of germs. Um, and you go down into an underground and you go into the toilets and you can have male or female toilets. So anyway, we, we put this on. Uh, this lady's a therapist herself. 
and that says I could we put, we put sensors on your fingers so we can tell how stressed you are yeah a little chart that shows you like a little graph and I could see this was right up at the top and I'm thinking hmm so I said to her what are you out of 10 you know from 0 to 10 and she went 12. <laughs> So then we put... Um, Somebody get me some bleach. <laughs> well, I was there and her sister was there as well and the family. So they're laughing as well, which actually helps, as you know. With the yeah. Bleach, make it fun. And um, so anyway, I then put on... I've got, you've got headphones on to, to, give, you know, to give you the full sensation. And um, we took a step by step. And as soon as you put what I would call mindfulness on here, so people sort of can relate to it, you know, you focus your breathing on the particular thing you're doing. Um, and it says, take a deep breath. And she is taking deep breaths. This is really <laughs> not her for six. But obviously we'll monitor it slowly and each, you know, take a bit of a step at a time. So basically she went into the toilet. There's some girls there on the phone chatting away one thing or another. Then you put your hand on the dirty toilet door to open it. You go into the toilet you come out you wash your hands so all this must have taken probably 10 minutes to go through at a very slow pace so then i let it run so she, it just did it automatically so she then went in and went through the same procedure she felt so much better the second time because basically you're just going through um a desensitization uh, yeah. but as you know with hypnotherapy um the brain itself doesn't really know right from wrong so as long as you're facing that scenario and you're calm, the brain will just accept it's not a, a, a fear because the vagus nerve's not being triggered to go into that sort of meltdown. So we did that one, and then I took her down into a basement for claustrophobic because um, we've sort of shown her how this works. So I was doing a few with her. So anyway, she came out of this lift at the, in the basement, which was fine. And then it, it's interesting how their senses work when you have a fear. She went, oh, my God, it smells down here. It's disgusting. So, of course, she's picking all these things up. And she says, this is almost worse than going into the public toilets. Wow. So yeah, she could actually that... smell something, even though it was just on a headset. Yeah. That's incredible how the mind works, isn't it? But, but, of course, if you think of how we do it with hypnotherapy, you will say to people, I want you to you know bright most colors make that image clear i want you to take a smell smell the flowers or whatever mm -hmm. you, yeah you yeah do. so we're using all of those senses but it's the actual um virtual reality is triggering those because your brain is actually there and mm. you know it believes you're there so um we did that one and then i says right well, have a little bit of fun and we'll, we'll do the fear of flying she, she had no fear of flying and what i tend to do if you haven't got a fear of something then I will, you know, I'll put that in just for a bit of fun. So anyway, the fear of flying is absolutely not. You're sitting on a plane next to people. The bloke next door is a bit geeky. He's, a, he's obviously an avatar, and he's talking to you. You think this isn't real, you know? Um, <laughs> you at, yeah, and you look out the window, and and it's like being at an airport, and you can see, you know, it, it just so happens. cool. But of course, I can control on the uh, laptop, you know, the captain speak and put the seatbelts on, all that sort of thing. So it really is real life. But she looked, at, yeah. But she looked down at her jeans and went, "Oh my goodness, my jeans are filthy." So that's something that I hadn't thought about because obviously we use it for fear of flying. But if you've got a real deep-seated fear and phobia of dirt, the the gently faded jeans look to her like dirt. Wow. Um, See, well, that's um, your perception, isn't it? That's gonna. You know that that's how you see the world those are what what gonna frighten you that's what's gonna make you feel uncomfortable and i suppose that's what her subconscious or that's what she perceived somebody else might have seen them as a very fashionable pair of jeans but for her she saw she saw sort of dirt and 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 yeah yeah and it's really interesting because when you talk to the guys that make this vr and unfortunately ricardo obviously couldn't be with us today oh we'll get he, him on another time yeah <laughs> the actual VR is not very, it's not crispy clear and it's made like that for a reason because it's making your brain want to work. Mm. So you, whilst everything is real in front of you, you can see everything, mm. your mind's making your own little bits up. So when she saw the jeans, she looked upon them as being dirty Maybe. rather than just a baby jean. And then we did a little bit of mindfulness. Um, the following day, I did one with her, that was it. She's not frightened of heights. So we took her up in a glass lift and then I took her across a, a gangway between two In a two glass towers. lift? 
Yeah. I'd love that. I'd love to go up in a glass lift. But if you are scared of heights, that must just be the most terrifying experience. It is. Um, but this is what I find completely fascinating because um, mm. I had a lady who was going to climb <laughs> Mount Kilimanjaro and she was frightened of flying in heights, which seemed a bit of a, you know, there's nothing like volunteer for something that... Extra challenge. <laughs> yeah. but, so anyway, she came to, to have this and she said she'd been for hypnotherapy, so her flying was sort of okay. She was happy she might get away with that. And I said, well, okay, we'll put the flying in anyway to calm you, you know, and, and just cover that. So I did. Um, what I said to her was, it doesn't matter whether you... I mean, the advantage about this, you're fully conscious. You know if anything goes really wrong, you can rip your headset off. Um, but I'm talking to you all the time. You've got your mindfulness going on. So we took her up in this glass lift, and then we took her across this um, gangway between two um, tower blocks. We've got wow. headphones on. We've got the wind whistling through her ears. Wow. And, and then I was really naughty, and I turned the fan on. So her hair's now blowing. <laughs> And what she said was, um, she says, I'm going to cross it. I said, whatever you do, just don't close your eyes. If you can keep your eyes open and put up with it, just tell yourself it's not real because you won't affect how the brain works because all your senses are being triggered. So to the yeah. brain. And as she's walking across this bridge, she's going, this isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real. <laughs> well, anyway, she, she, went up, she went and did a challenge and she said at one point on the mountain, there was a 300 foot drop and she stood on the edge and looked over. And that was just, Whoa. yeah. And she said she knew fully well. She did one on her hands and knees there, got crawling along. Yeah, what an achievement. Yeah. But of course, Amazing. if you are calm and you have been through a trauma, you don't have a trauma. That's my perception of how this works. You know, it would have been great to have Ricardo here to, to you know, to, to go through it from a, a yeah. point of view. But yeah. Well, it's fascinating. And for those who don't really understand how hypnotherapy works, we, we, we deal with the subconscious, which is like 80% of, of what is controlling you. Only the, it's only 20% that's conscious control. Everything else is automatic. And if you've got a phobia or a fear um, about something, if you're ever even in a situation that looks similar, you know, if you think that if you're frightened of spiders and you think there might be a spider in the room, you're going to start having a physical reaction even if there isn't a spider there, just because you think there might be one there. Um, so <clears throat> we, we, we do, hypnotherapy is fantastic for helping people to, to get beyond these fears and, and phobias. Um, but the, and, and, the lang and, and, and those fears and phobias are stored, if you like, in the subconscious mind. They're a, a subconscious and automatic reaction. I hope I'm explaining it well enough. And um, the language, if you like, of the conscious mind is, is words. It's, 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 it's speech. It's, it's vocabulary. It's conversation, actual words, um, symbols, if you like, of, of, of language. Um, and but the, the the language of the unconscious mind, the language, the the way that we communicate with the unconscious mind is through imagery, imagination, and emotions. The language of the subconscious mind is is imagination and emotions. So when we want to have that conversation with the subconscious and help to change people's perceptions, so they're not having these automatic responses whenever they even think there might be a spider there or when they even consider the idea of getting on an aeroplane or my goodness going in a glass elevator up high or somewhere like that that would really freak a lot of people out i'd love it um <laughs> but when we're communicating with our clients subconscious to to change that we use their imagination. We use them. And, and we're all very skilled in being able to guide people to use their imagination. And that, like, like Ian, what you were saying, the brain doesn't know right from wrong. It doesn't know what's real and what's imagined. If you, I'm sure you've sat in a cinema and watched a horror film and jumped, or you've watched a, a romantic moment and you felt all, oh, it's so lovely. And <laughs> we are, we respond to to images and we respond physically um, to things that happen in our imagination because our subconscious mind 
understands that as just as real as actually being there in real life in person. So we take people into a, a trance state where we can have very powerful transformational conversations with the subconscious and we use the imagination um, and get people to visualize different things. And there are other techniques that we incorporate as well, but the language of the subconscious mind is emotion and imagination. And so we use emotion and we use imagination. We use that language to be able to speak with the subconscious. But not everybody has a multicolored, you know, imagination. Not everybody can imagine a big pink elephant or a, a blue bird flying in the sky. Maybe, as I said that, you may picture those images in your, in your mind, but not everybody can do that. Um, and so we use other, other methods for people who are not visual. But I love the visualization aspect of hypnotherapy, and it's incredibly powerful and, and really useful. So for those who don't or who aren't able to visualize so well in their imaginations, this just seems perfect because we're giving people an outline or a skeleton of an image or of a situation of, of a, a virtual reality situation, but it's not so clear that we're being, when we're completely guiding them, we're still giving our clients the opportunity to put their own understanding on it, to add their own bits of imagination to it. And that makes it very, very real for them. I absolutely love this idea um, of, of using virtual reality to really help people. It must give them a great sense of, of confidence that, 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 that phobia is never going to come back if they've had an experience that they understand to be, or their subconscious mind certainly understands to be very real. You know, I used to be scared of flying. I'm not anymore because I've been on an airplane and I wasn't scared. Absolutely incredible work. But what do you see as the, the main differences or the main difference between virtual reality therapy and clinical hypnotherapy? Well, just going back to that point you made there, that lady that was treated with OCD, mm -hmm. the following day she rang me and said, I haven't bleached my hands this morning. Amazing. I can't believe that because we had an obsession for bleaching my hands. Mm -hmm. Then a few days later, it was actually one of the relatives said that when she went out to restaurants, and this is how it affected her life, she, she would smell the, the cups and the glasses. And if they smelt a little bit, you know, there was a dirt there, off she went. Um, she went to a birthday party where it was a child's birthday party. They'd scattered all the stuff on the table, the little stars and things. And she was licking her finger, picking the stars up and sticking them on her face. And everybody was just like, wow, what are you doing here? Because they're... I really can't good. imagine anyone with OCD doing that. No. And she no way. couldn't believe how that had changed. And when I spoke to her about six months, late, six months later, she said, I forgot to tell you, I'm frightened of spiders. And today I picked a spider up and put it outside. And I think once you've triggered that confidence within your brain, yeah. she emailed me when COVID started and she said, you cannot believe how you know, what you've done for me because I would have been sitting in the corner spraying everybody with bleach. Can you imagine? And she said, it doesn't bother me now. And I saw her the other week and she says, I'm not the slightest bit bothered. Now that's a huge transformation than, than what was messing about on the, on the headset for an hour. I just you know, I'm I'm far from OCD when it comes to cleaning. In fact, I could I could do with uh, hiring your uh, OCD lady to come around and do a job on my house. But um, I I can't wash my hands without singing a song now. Um, I think I've been what you know just because I've been watching it's on it's on the TV and every it's that wash 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 your hands wash them nice and clean. I'm not going to sing anymore, <laughs> but I can't wash my hands without singing a song now. It's affected my brain. Um, but if you have OCD at this time, the TV, the information that's coming from the TV, it's so filled with fear. And if you've already got a fear, oh my goodness, I don't know how you're getting through this time, you know, masks, no masks, do they work, do they not work, should I, should I wear, I'd think if I had OCD, I'd probably just walk around with a, in a, in a, 
hazmat suit and a and a you know with a oxygen mask on or something i really don't know how how people have managed to get through this time with all the fear that's been you know thrown at us um, and all the worry and concern about just general hygiene but with this additional amount of fear it's just incredible that you've been able to support this woman to to feel so much safer in her own body in her own life in her own existence it's incredible well done amazing work it is um but also science during the covid lockdown um we used to do this side by side so you, i've got a headset here so i'll give you the headset i will control everything they now put it online um so as long as you've got a, an android phone and a headset and i recently went into um B and M where we are, and they're selling like really cheap headsets. They are cheap and cheerful. They're selling mm. the fiber. So if you've got an Android phone, we can treat you at home. So all you do is download their app. I then do a Zoom call, and during that Zoom call, you give me a password that's on your headset, and, and away we go. And I had a lady the other day. Wow. Uh, her daughter had been affected by COVID, if you like. So her fear had become worse, which is basically what you were saying there. As yeah, we hardly surprising. And they did a lot of canoeing and they were frightened. She was frightened of birds. Um, so anyway, she was only 14, 15. So she was a little bit frightened at first. So I got, I'm doing the Zoom call with her, with her mum there. And um, I said, well, if you're frightened of putting your headset on, she thought the birds were going to fly out. I said, well, go on a fairground and we'll go on a Ferris wheel. So of course I put the Ferris wheel on and she was having fun and everything else. And then we did one with pigeons. Um, and it's just a big square with pigeons around, with pigeons on your hand and all that sort I'm of thing. not a big fan of pigeons. No. Definitely not. They're like flying rats. <laughs> but, but again, we should, yeah, that's what they are, aren't they? Um, <sighs> Horrible. But she was one. feeding the pigeons with a bird phobia. Yeah, yeah. Well, at first she was a little Whoa. bit apprehensive. Now, we have facilities on there. We can put up like a one to ten in your goggles. So you just look at it and, and it will tell you what, what you your fear level is your sud level, you know, your subjective view of discomfort. Um, now, her mum was holding her hand and she was saying, when you first started, she was a little bit out, but I was talking away to her. hand really tight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was, yeah. And when we got going, I eventually put in this headset, what, what's your level, you know, one to ten, and she went six, and her mum said, no, she wasn't, she was about an eight. Um, so, anyway, within ten minutes, she was down to a three and then a two. And a couple of days later, wow. they contacted me to say that they'd been out canoeing. Uh, there was a couple of um, ducks that came by the canoe. Normally, they would have to sort of box her in a little bit and tell her to breathe quietly and all this sort of thing. She didn't bother with them. And then as she came up, there was two geese on the side that jumped in in front of her. And they said normally that would have been complete meltdown time, you know. She just chased them down the water. She just paddled behind them, didn't bother. And she says, I can't believe how just being online so she was at home and i was at home and we're doing this you know with, with a mum present and everything and we just made a bit of fun of it but again it's just how it's affecting the brain is just to me this is now the future i think there's a couple of hospitals here who use it uh, and obviously then some private sort of um, therapists so but, yeah, oh, yeah it'd be amazing if you were having to have some kind of minor procedure that wasn't very comfortable you could maybe slip a headset on and go on a ferris wheel or i don't know go where uh, go skiing or something i love that idea i think it's brilliant i could do one for dentists well they have one that's um for injections so you're actually a doctor surgeon they come up and take take blood from you um and there's an mri scanner so a lot of people who are frightened to go on an mri scanner you actually go in it and for those that have been in one that racket it makes you know there's da, 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 da all those noises are there and, and the sensations and you feel like you're in an MRI scanner. So once you've been that a few times, then it just... So know, good, isn't it? We know... How you get through it. It's just we, yeah, we know that with um, hypnotherapy, we can help 
people to to step into that imaginary future and they can kind of live experiences in their imagination and how we know that that lays down neural pathways um, and if if those neural pathways are kind of like situations that maybe used to scare them but now they've got this new situation and they're feeling very calm and very relaxed when they're in that situation that set up the mind to to completely be fear free or worry free concern free because uh, it's it's had a neurological impact it's changed the structure of the brain as well hasn't it changed the the structure of the brain it's changed your perception of the situation and it just seems to work really really quickly that's what i find amazing you know and mm -hmm. most people with one good session will then progress themselves you know um, so yeah, it is quite phenomenal. It's it's amazed me to be quite honest. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you combine this virtual reality imaging fabulousness with your clinical hypnotherapy. How do you how do you find it assists or enhances the services that you offer? I think really it depends because we treat everybody as an individual. So it depends. You know, that's the holistic thing, isn't it? So, yeah. But, um, but what I find, I've done hypnotherapy with people before. Um, there's ones on here for eating. Um, so I had a lady who um, had an issue with stress eating. So again, we put the mask on and you're in a restaurant and I can show you what food you're eating and all that sort of thing. Uh, it makes the noise of you chewing. So again, everything's been uh, very realistic. But I did do some hypnotherapy before that. And then I, did, I used the, the, um, the SIAS app you know um so you just it's just picking your client really and seeing what's best for them you know and if they have got a fear what i find is you you will try and treat the problem they've got but if you can put them through a fearful um or, or address their fears but what i find is people once they've gone through it will go wow i feel a real sense of achievement I yeah feel I really achieve something that lady who walked across that bridge between two skyscrapers with her hair blowing and the wind was in the air. <laughs> she took a deep breath at the end and she went, wow, I can't believe I've done that. And that's yeah. just, they, in their own mind, the mind has done that. Yeah, yeah. you've done it. It might just be in your imagination, but your body, your, your brain, your, your body feels it's real. Mm. Um, and so if you've done it once successfully and you, you, you can do it again, um, and that that's just gives people such a great sense of confidence. Do you actually induce trance and then put the virtual reality headset on, or do you do the tr do we do induce trance with the headset on? How do you work? How do you work with it? Well, that's the advantage. You don't need to, to use your hypnotherapy actually with it. So all you do is put your headset on. <clears throat> Again, let's say the sort of average time. They say that within 20 minutes, your brain will accept what you're seeing as real as if you were going through it all. So the first few minutes, they're getting adjusted to uh, the weirdness, of, if you like, because when you're on the plane, the guy next to you is an avatar does look a little bit weird. <laughs> you always well, end up sitting there so weirdo anyway. <laughs> they usually yeah, end up being my mates. <laughs> they look a bit creepy, to be honest, because most people go, oh, yeah, who's that sitting next to me? <laughs> but then it, once the captain speaks and you're watching all the, the rigmarole of where the emergency exits are, you're looking out the window. Because I can distract you as well. So, if, for example, that girl with a fear of um, pigeons, there's a little boy there playing with his car and chasing the pigeons around. So, when I divert her attention to what the boy's doing, then um, the birds are still going on in the background, but, but, you, but you, the fear's going down, if you know what I mean. Mm. I had one, um, but of course, all your sensations are being triggered as well. Mm. The, the fear of spiders one, we've got, um, it's like a little QR code, and we can put that down, and I can control how much, but when you put the phone towards it, um, it will spiders will come out of the qr code in effect and, and I was thinking, yeah and you can have this <laughs> and this woman had an awful fear at the beginning and then what i did was i put the qr code on a chair next to her so the spiders were running around the chair in effect and i says put your hand down onto that qr code and she did and uh, i mean obviously this is at the very end and that suddenly she went i can feel them on my fingers like crawling on her yeah and of course, that's her brain going. I yeah. should 
to that. And of course, at that point, you know, then you've got the full link that they are fully submerged. And she's quite happy to sit there with the spiders running around her hand. And I can't really believe cool. that. Yeah. Amazing. I worked with a client last year who had a fear of spiders, um, but she couldn't go to the bathroom at work because she thought there might be a spider in there. So she ended up with irritable bowel syndrome because she wasn't going to the loo when she needed to go. Um, and it was horrific. Just even for her, just the idea that there might be a spider there uh, was enough to prevent her from even entering into that space, even though it was quite a necessary space to enter a few times in the day. So the idea that you can go from that level of phobia right down to letting spiders run all over your hands, um, even if it is just in your imagination, in, in just 10 to 20 minutes, is absolutely phenomenal. I can totally see why you've you've got right into it. Um, really amazing. So you combine all these amazing treatments, clinical hypnotherapy, the virtual reality, the science uh, treatments and programs that you run. Um, and you also have the Emmet for horses, dogs and humans and yep. scar work as well. How do you how do you feel that these different modalities all overlap? When you balance the body up, and you reduce the pain levels mm -hmm. that then reduces the stress and by reducing the stress you're reducing your pain levels because mm -hmm. it was just one big circle and, and from my own personal experience when i had pain i had depression when the more depression i had the more pain i received mm -hmm. and once you break that cycle up and i think it's about giving us that empowerment that we can succeed so um it's controlling the vagus nerve. But when I do that glass lift, I, I'm not frightened of heights. I go up on roofs and things like that. But even when I'm in that lift or I've got the goggles on and I look down, because I've got sensors on my hand, we can see the vagus nerve trigger that fight or flight. And as soon as you look down, you see that spike. And I'm not frightened of it. And it, it sort of brings home the bit that we can't control. So um, by then using this facility to control that, it's just giving you that empowerment to um, control control your own fear. So although your vagus nerve will trigger itself, that's your fight or flight where you you got to go for the, for the listeners that are there. Yeah. Or, you know. Um, that feeling when your stomach's in your mouth. <laughs> that power to then go, it's all right. Yeah. And switch it back off again. And, and that's what you, you, you're doing, I think, throughout these um, virtuality therapies. As you look down, you see, you, you, you automatically trigger the fight or flight, and your guts go, but you know you're not you're, you're not really there. So, so it's a real clever, clever thing, you know. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and it's empowerment to, to people because they then, like that lady, she had OCD, but the fear of spiders was somewhere down the line, and that's just fixed itself through being confident you know, and having that empowerment. Yeah, like domino effect almost mm -hmm. of you've got rid of the main thing, you, your brain's worked out how to overcome fears and phobias, so it's going to do it for all of them. I love that uh, healing. It's it's like it's awoken that inner physician and enabled, you know, shown the body, this is how you heal. And once the body knows how to do that, once the mind knows how to do that, I don't believe there's any separation. I think mind and body are are so interconnected they are just one one and the same um but it's incredible the, the absolutely incredible the work that you do it's so so fascinating we should really give a shout out to all of the guys who you work with at the silver web holistic center because i know that you work with some amazing guys there who who who, who is it that you work alongside there who have you got uh, well, first of all, we've got Tammy. She mainly does crystal kids, so she does crystals and um, she does EFT, but that's mainly she, she, her um, true passion is children. Um, we've got Jody. She's just brilliant at Reiki. She is unbelievable. She's a master and she does it's all the things. a real things. healer. Yeah, she is phenomenal. We've got Bosco. He's a, he's a martial arts expert. He does a ver is it a ver is that how you pronounce it? But he's a great, he does massage and all that. We've got... Um, Suzanne, who does um, kinesiology, who deals with mainly chronic fatigues um, yeah. and fibromyalgia and ME and that sort of thing. Um, and also we've got, we've got Emma, she's a clinical reflexologist. So 
Suzanne wow. myself and we've now formed a CIC um, which is a community interest um, company the idea of that is that we will be able to go for grants and then treat people at source free and the other oh, day oh that's wonderful yeah because there's a there's so much out there and again this is where mm. the national health is brilliant and, and you know if your life's at risk we've got the best service but when you get to a point where there's not much they can do a lot of people just seem to be left at the side of the road and yeah we put an advert up saying the three of us are going to run a two-hour session for three weeks and we're going to have um, a little bit of a talk explaining how the body works and what have you then we're going to treat them and monitor it all well within three hours we have over 70 inquiries and we only i am not to... surprised yeah so um yeah we're going to do that so you know but it's a fantastic little center in play cross it really is I I was looking for a room to rent and they they the other thing I like about them as well is that they share things they have therapist nights so you would be welcome to come to one of their therapist nights we don't look upon people as a threat we look upon them as learning if you like you yeah know. we're all learning from each other and and supporting each other that's definitely how it is now um, I think the days of competition are, and, and feeling threatened by people are well and truly over because there's so much need for what we do. Um, and like you were saying, you, you get your label from the NHS. They kind of say, well, you know, we can manage it. We can main, maintain maybe where you are, but we, there's nothing really we can do. And that's where we really step in as holistic medical practitioners, as integrative medical practitioners. And to have such a great team at uh, the Silver a web holistic center where you can refer to different people and really make sure that when you when you walk in the door as a client perhaps not really knowing who to go to where should i you know which therapist should i pay you know if, you, if you've not got a great deal of money that can be quite restriction uh, restriction and um, you can walk in the door and you know that there you're going to get guided to the right therapist for you because everybody knows what everybody's doing and everybody's working together and it's it's, it's great to see that happening in holistic therapy real professionalism right across the country um, and it's just wonderful to to see that and and great that you you're hopefully going to be getting some grants so that you can you can offer this to people for free that'll be amazing absolutely incredible ian it's been awesome having you on the wednesday wellbeing show this week i've loved it i've proper geeked out on your virtual reality thing i'm definitely going to have a go um, and you were saying weren't you that there's a website can everybody just go on the website and have a look at it can everyone kind of go check it out and can can anyone just get access to the sort of virtual reality programs that are there how does it work okay well you can go on to science itself um they've got their own website obviously but during the covid they've got a, a website which is www stay strong at home.com and that's where you go to to download the um well actually it's on google apps but that's where they'll give you all the instructions of how to download uh, the science pro app um, all the information's on there there are practitioners here in the uk um, who will give you the first 30 minutes for free you download the app you will have two um relaxing um virtual reality therapies there that are there for you to use oh, on the phone i'm still app. having this i'm yeah. still doing it <laughs> just and for me though <laughs> yeah, just, pick, just pick whoever's local to you they'll do the first 30 minutes for free you know so it's all on it's all on that um, stay strong at home um website so www.staystrongathome.com yeah, yeah. No. and you can go and check it out and have a look at it and ian for those people who want to uh to find you yourself and work with you because that would be amazing for them how do people uh how do people get in touch with you i've got www.virtualrealitytherapies.co.uk virtual reality therapies.co.uk i'm going to bob all these uh, these links on the bio to go with the the show and i'll pop it out on the podcast as well so people can uh, can click on that and find you 
what an amazing what an amazing uh, team you're part of at the Silver Web Holistic Center what a fantastic therapist you are I love that you work with humans and animals and uh, I love that you uh, definitely appealing to my geeky side with the virtual reality stuff I saw want to have a go of one of those relaxation ones and see whether my subconscious mind activates I'd quite like uh, I don't know what shall I go for cocktails on the beach we got can we have some of that please <laughs> can you take me to uh, somewhere lovely <laughs> that be nice. I'm totally up for a holiday once a week virtual reality will do me <laughs> amazing thank you so much for coming on tonight's show Ian it's been great to have you on thank you that's been lovely, thank you. And it just leaves me to wish all of you, wherever you are in the world, um, if you're listening in the UK or if you're listening right across the globe, um, thank you so much for listening. And uh, Ian and I, we wish you an absolutely wonderful, wonderful week of well-being. Have a great week. <laughs>